repent for the kingdom of heaven. Repent, 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 repent. He was all about let's turn it around. Nope, not just raise your hand, not just say it out of your mouth. Like repent. So I just want to talk about the Bible. I want to ask you a question. So probably Jason's getting ready to run here. So uh, Matt, can you just in a few sections just very briefly tell us what do you think kind of like the story of the Bible kind of is? Just in a sentence or two. Just. I think it's uh, probably creation, destruction, and then redemption. Okay. And who else? That's good. Thank you. Richard, what would you say? He, he really summed it up in three simple <laughs> words. That's, that's about as good as I could get. It's about God's scheme for redeeming man from his, from his own sin. Scheme yeah. Of redemption. Amen. Okay. So we're talking about redemption. We're talking about this love story. We're talking about from the very beginning of creating us. God wants you. He wants you. He loves you and he wants you. He created all of us and he wants us. I know we go through times where we don't feel like maybe we're worthy. Okay, we're not. We go through and we know we upset him. He still loves us. And he's a God that is just. He's a God that's merciful. He's a God that's holy. And so he wants us, and he's so holy, he can't have filth get on him. But I love you, and I want you. And so he's merciful, and we see mercy all throughout Scripture. It's just, it's huge. And he has this gigantic plan to reconcile us to him. That's just how much he loves us. And when did that really start? Well, it started before he poof, just spoke it, poof. And here comes the world, and here comes everything. He had this plan from the beginning. I don't know how God thinks sometimes. He's like, he just, he loves us so much that he created us knowing we were going to be these bratty little two-year-olds, right? And we're just going to keep just, he's like, oh, you know. And you see him express that sometimes. But overall, he's still merciful. So it's a big story and I like to keep context. Um, if I ever teach again, we'll see after tonight, right? But if I ever teach again, right? I like context. So we have the overall context of what's going on. And if we can keep, if we look at verses together, I hate when people proof text. And I used to be a proof texter, and it was really, really bad. But instead, if we'll look and keep that in, well, what's the paragraph? And what's the paragraphs? Sometimes those paragraphs, they, they spill over in this chapter and they spill over into that chapter. But you look at them together. And how does that fit into the context of what is that book? What is that author in that time, in that language saying to this group of people? What did he want to say to them? Forget about us. What is that message? And if we can understand that context, now separately we can step back and say, wow, now can I pull out some principles of application for me? And they're always there, right? His word is living and it's active. I don't know about you, Nicholas, but I can read a scripture. I can read that same scripture next year and the next year and the next year. And like the fourth or fifth year is like, oh, man, that is the most profound thing I've ever read. Well, you're in a different stage of life. You're facing something different. That's kind of what happens with God's word. So, it is, um, Luke carries on exactly the same theme, right? Because it's really, it's everything in, the, in Scripture is to a pinnacle. And that pinnacle in Scripture is all leading up to Christ. Everything about Christ. And then the backside of that's pointing back, going, hey, look, he did this, he did this. I want to talk to you about how this all... And the other guys were all standing over here going, hey, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, Messiah King, Messiah King, Messiah King. And boy, they had that all messed up. They didn't even realize when Messiah King was walking with them. So it's the time of year when we talk about Christmas. Um, but when I mention Christmas to you, what kind of thoughts first come to mind? 
What, what, what do you kind of think about? I mean, like, honestly, like, what kind of things come to mind just in general about Christmas? Yes. Well, I grew up, I grew up only celebrating Christmas as a secular holiday. So who all can relate Santa and presents yeah, okay. and yeah, okay. those kinds of things. Yeah. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Thank you for sharing that. That's on my list. Okay, good. <laughs> Not the naughty list. It's just on the list. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It's always been a family time. Ooh, okay. And ga time. gatherings and yeah, yeah, there was the tree and there was the food, but it was mostly family. Okay. So, we're going to dig into that a little bit. If it's family time, who can be honest? I'm not going to this one I'm not going to call on you, but like um th does the family thing get kind of stressful around Christmas for anybody else or is it just me? You know, it's like Right? We just all say, whoa. And so that's probably the first thing. When I think of Christmas, it's kind of stress. And that's like really messed up. But it kind of is. It's like family dynamics. And some of it's close. And some of it isn't. And some of it's a strain. Now we're expanding family. Now how do we do? How do we take in in-laws, outlaws, bylaws, in-laws, whatever. It's like, how are we doing all that, right? And it's like, Aah. okay. That's part of Christmas. What else is Christmas? Judy. I mentioned Christmas, do you think? Well, that was the day Jesus was born. We celebrate it December the 25th, but we think it was in the spring when he was born. Yes. And that's what we should really celebrate, is that not all these gifts and all of this stuff, the real true meaning of Christmas. Yeah. So maybe we get slightly off on like all this gift giving thing? Anybody else in the room, right? We kind of go kind of overboard, some of us. Um, and it's really not about us or the little ones or the big ones or the old ones or the whatever, but it really is about Jesus, so thank you for bringing that up. Any other buddy, anyone else want to answer anything about a thought of whenever we say Christmas, something comes to your mind? Yes. What? Snow. Wow. Okay, listen. We're in Florida. Florida. Okay, so, yes. That is a great... Our middle son, he's flying up right now tonight, so they're supposed to be in snow. So we'll see what happens in Ohio. So where's that thing? Okay. All right. Technology, go. Oh. Hey, there we go. I found it. Sorry. I didn't know where this thing is. So, uh, Some of your first thoughts about Christmas is about stress. Nobody mentioned shopping. We mentioned gifts, but wow, that's a whole different thing, right? Um, the busyness of it all, uh, maybe splurges, right? You can get into some arguments, and uh, usually what happens is we mess this up that we overspend for the holidays in January as this reality hits when that little credit card statement shows up, right? And it's like, we spent $1,400 on Christmas gifts? What did we do? It's like, some of you are like, $1,400, that's nothing. Well, good for you, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> so we have gifts, but it is also a spirit of thankfulness. Would you turn in Luke chapter 1, please? What I'm about to try to do here is uh, see how this goes. Ooh, okay. Um, I'm going to try to attempt to balance. I think this time, of heart, this time of year is so hard, mainly because of the secular stuff, and I agree with that, because, like, man, that's how I grew up. Um, the mystery of it all, the story of it all, uh, the danger in teaching us about Jesus Christ's birth is, I know it, I know it, I'm going to blow right over it, so I'm trying to, let, we're going to read a lot together, and we're going to have a few comments, and we're going to let God talk to us about his story, so I'm asking you if you would pause from all the junk going on in your head, perhaps, at this time of year, and let's just see what God kind of says. But the balance I'm trying to do is I want to try to show you some very incredible teachings that there's some major parallels that are going on at this exact same time. So I don't want to get too heady about all that, but there's some really great things I'm really excited about that we'll spend some time. So what we need is Luke chapter 1. We're going to read 5 through 25. So what I'd like to do, this is crazy, but I'm going to ask you, Two verses, ready? Five, six, would you do seven, eight? You don't have a Bible. Seven, eight, yep. nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, nope, 13, 14, 
15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. All right, can you hand it? Or I'll walk in on this one. Okay. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decreeing blamelessly. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. I'm sorry, I thought you were in Luke 1, but I'm kind of lost here. We are in Luke 1. We're verse, what, 13? Okay. Okay. Uh, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord. Shall he turn to the Lord their God? And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So, is that the last one I need to say? When his time of service was complete, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Okay, thank you so much for everyone who read. Don't worry, there'll be more opportunities for this side next. Don't worry. Don't worry. Judy's up and running out the door. I saw that. So So we're going to read an incredible parallel story. I mean, it's kind of easy if you've read the story before, which I'm really assuming you all have, but what a parallel to have little tweaks of differences along, but then how even those tweaks of differences actually blend together. This is so powerful and good. Zacharias, he's old, he's righteous, he is blameless, and he's here for his priestly service. Now, the priestly service, according to the Talmud, what would happen is they had the right to perform this very high duty to go in, and they had one of four slots that day, and they would draw lots, and who would go and do what part, who would go in and clean up, who would set up new fire, who would turn around and um, offer the incense, and then the fourth one would be, well, who's going to go in and do the meat and do those offerings? So this is going on. Now, if your family, your clan got chosen to be able to do it, then you were not allowed to do that again that week. But there was a bigger problem that was going on is 
there were, they estimate, over 20,000 priests. So therefore, you usually only got to do this once in your lifetime. So at the time that you're selected, now we have to imagine you're going in, there's this room of all these priests, they're doing the lot. Seemed like a lot of people like to have the third lot from what I could read, and this is the burning of the incense. So why? Why? What, what is it about incense? I'm looking for hands. Yes. Just wait. He's fast. He's whew, Thanks. He gives off a wonderful aroma. He sure does. And so I read some different things about the sweet gums and the different type of trees and the acacia, all this stuff that they would do and the different... But basically, it's the sweet aroma that's going up. But what do we know about incense going up out of the book of Revelation? Revelation 5 and verse 8. Anita, can you read that for us? you have your Bible? I'm picking you because, like, Jason is so close to you. This is great. Revelation 5, what? 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Mm. The same thing's going on up in heaven. How awesome is that? He talks about these prayers being an aroma and an incense. Well, we even read about what was happening is if we go back to Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 9 and 10, his lot fell to burn the incense. He goes into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. I never caught that before. It's the hour of incense. I don't know whether that meant that's just the appointed time. Hey, we're doing this at 10 a.m. type deal. Or is it also 10 a.m. and we're doing this for an hour? But the whole multitude was out there praying and praying and praying. I wonder what that desperation was like. I wonder if there was callousness. I wonder if there was heartbreak. I wonder if there was deep weeping. I would think so. They're a lot like us, right? We're just not Jews at that time, but there probably would be. So what is he doing? It says he's praying also. See, if we see um, he goes in, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, in verse 12, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And the angel said, do not be afraid for your prayer is heard. Well, it's, I'm like, all right. So I'm just thinking, it's like, if I got my once in a lifetime prayer card ticket, and this is as close as I think I'm probably ever going to be to God, I'm going to use it. I'm going to like whipping that baby out here, right? And I'm in, this is one time in my life, this is as close as I'm going to get to the Holy of Holies, and I get to step in there, and I see the curtain over there, and I know, don't go near the curtain, because I know nope, I'm going to die. But this is going to be my job. I am just broken, Lord. We really want a child. Would you? Could you? Well, of course you can. Look what you did with Abraham and Sarah. Do you think maybe with us? My wife is hurting. We, we read in Scripture, and it talks about she has felt the reproach of the people. You had to understand, that time you were not having kids, you were really looked down on like you were damaged goods. It's terrible. But that's what was going on, and she felt that reproach. And so you can just imagine him pleading with the Lord for this, and an angel shows up. So he reacts in fear, <clears throat> and he says, um, verse 13, And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy, and you will have gladness, and many will rejoice at your birth. I bet you he memorized that really quick. 
I cannot wait to get home to tell. For he will be great in the sight of whom? The Lord. Have you ever thought maybe that God has planned things for you to do that would be great in the sight of the Lord? I mean, this is, you know, we talk about um, praying over the babies in the womb and we talk about pronouncing blessings. Oh, man, that's, we got nothing on this one. And, you sh- and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, in verse 15, and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there were very few before this time that at different times they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would do these great things and they would just do miracles and they would do incredible prophecies. And so it's like, ooh, okay, this is very special what's about to happen to my wife and to my son, to us. And it says, I love the end of verse 15, it'll even be from his mother's womb. That's worth circling, writing down, keeping track of. You know, it's like I can kind of remember back 26 years ago when we had our first child, a little baby, and the thump, 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 and talking to him inside, you know, her being pregnant with them. And, but this, this is going to be different when we hit it here in a few minutes. And this child is going to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Whoa. How many can that really be said of? I mean, there have been great men and women of faith that have turned and helped to turn many that, where the Lord has granted repentance and turned them back. In verse 17, he'll also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn. Every time I read stuff about dads, it gets me. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. For him to say that meant so many of the fathers were known that their hearts were not for their kids. If not, they wouldn't have needed the turning. That is very much what's going on today, isn't it? We just don't want our kids. I use that very loosely, but you know what I'm saying. It's like and we have fathers that are dads, but they're not really fathers. And he's going to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Oh, man, I wish that would roll out across America. We could use a whole lot of wisdom, right? We could use a whole lot of justice. We could get rid of a lot of corruptness that's going on. And he's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people to prepare hearts to get them. Now, you and I may have some really great ideas on here's a PowerPoint presentation. Here's five ways that, John, you can turn their hearts and this and that. Holy mackerel. He sends him out into the wilderness, and people go flocking to him because they're broken, and this is a true message. And his thing was repent for the kingdom of heaven. Repent, 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 repent. He was all about let's turn it around. Nope, not just raise your hand, not just say it out of your mouth. Like, repent. Repent. Well, isn't he just fulfilling scripture? Later, we see that in this. Zechariah says to the angel, now, I've been praying, 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 and I'm a righteous and blameless man, and I'm using my prayer card, and I'm there in the holy, and God answers it, and an angel appears, and my reaction is, I love this, how shall I know this? Like, I'm from Missouri. I'm from the show me, prove it state. You know, it's like, come on, fess up and prove it. I'm like, say what? We may be get a little bit saying, well, I wouldn't have been doubting. Eh, Be careful about that. Um, There's a lot of human nature. So this baby joy, uh, this baby John is going to come with all this joy. And he says, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Well, then what in the world were you praying about? Did you not believe? <laughs> it's like, and the angel answered, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Okay, so I never caught that before. I've, must, I've read this a bunch of times. I've just been thinking more and more and more about the presence of the Lord. How do you get in the presence of the Lord? Now I'm looking for answers. 
How do you get in the presence of the Lord? Yes. Through baptism. Okay. How else do you get in the presence of the Lord? I'm not saying this wrong at all. How else? Prayer. Yes. Prayer. Okay. Ooh, wait. For whenever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there I am in the mm. midst of them. Yeah. Worship. Very good. Yes, Richard. When you get into his word, you get into his presence. Yeah. Praise. Praise. Yeah. Praise. Worship. Singing. Praise brings you into presence. Yeah. Hmm. So we need to take that thought right there, and maybe I encourage you, January the 3rd, show up with that. Praise in our prayer service. Start looking for it, finding it, looking, drawing, print it out, circle it, be ready to pray, praise to God. Um, the word you, you all mentioned, I don't know exactly, was it Richard? I don't remember who it was, I'm sorry. Um, that's how we're in the presence of the Lord. We're getting to hear it. I was just meeting with, I was so encouraged. I was just meeting with a young man two days ago. And I was asking him about his, his walk and trying to help him with some things. And he's like, I really love praying. I'm actually pretty good about praying. And I'm like, well, that's great. And he's like, and then I'm getting better about reading the word. And I'm finally now figuring it out after about 12 years. It's breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I'm taking in the word and I'm praying out the word. That right there, those two disciplines will put you into the presence of the Lord and it'll change our lives forever. Okay, verse uh, 24. So he goes home. And now she conceives, and it says, She hid herself five months, saying, The Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. But I'm going to kind of keep it a secret. You don't exactly show the first week or month or sometimes two. or something, just depending on who you are. And so she kind of hides for five months. Okay, so now we're on this side. You guys ready to read? We're going to do uh, Luke 1, 26 through 28. So if I point in, you don't want to, that's fine. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, nope. 36, 36 37. Would you do 38? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings. Uh, o favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said, whoop, is that yours? Thirty. Cut you off. <laughs> but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of Most High. The Lord God will give him his, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I'm so glad a woman read that last one. That's awesome. So <laughs> be done unto me. So backing up 26 to 28, it's the sixth month now. Gabriel's back. Six month reprieve, hadn't been on the scene, doing a lot in the background, I'm sure. But now he's up in Nazareth. He comes to a young virgin, which we believe she was a teenager, most likely. And verse 28 says, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. You are blessed. And she kind of starts like verse 29, the reaction. Remember, we're running a parallel. The birth of John over here and the birth of Jesus over here, all in the same chapter. Verse 29. Sorry. um, Oh, in verse Yeah, 29. She was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting was this. So she's troubled and afraid. He's troubled and afraid. We know that from verse 30, he says, don't be troubled and afraid. Well, what kind of greeting was that? I'm highly favored. I'm blessed. I'm just this little teenage girl that's betrothed to be married. and The Lord's with me? Who am I? That might be a really great question for all of us. Um, We we do a lot of classes. We do a lot of stuff on identity. And it is amazing how we mess up our identity. The whispers of the world, the whispers of the devil, and the whispers of ourselves, and the whispers of those that are close by that actually harm us, that we do not hear the whispers of Father. And Father just told her, highly favored, the Lord is with you. You are blessed among all women. Don't be afraid. And then he does all these promises, right? <clears throat> Starts talking to her about, you're going to conceive and you're going to bring forth what? You're going to bring forth a girl? No. A daughter? Twins, triplets, a boy, a son, multiple sons. You're going to bring forth a son. And this is going to be a son of sons. And just like he just told over here, said, you're, you're going to name him John. You're going to name him Jesus or Jesus. Heshua, derivative of Joshua. The um, meaning of Jehovah is salvation. I love how their names, all through, I love the meaning of names. You kind of, all throughout the scripture, and they name them, you're like, wow. So every time they would walk up, Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Jehovah is salvation. Teacher, teacher Jesus, teacher Jehovah is salvation. I mean, it's just, Yep, that's what I'm here all about. This is what I'm all about. This is really who I am. And he tells them not only that, going to be the son of man, going to be the son of God, going to be the savior of all mankind. His name will be Jesus. And he'll be great. And he's been called the son of the highest. I don't know when I've last heard that in prayer. Thank you, highest one. I've heard almighty and omnipotent and all-knowing and I just haven't heard anyone really pray saying the highest and thank you for your son of the highest. This is the pinnacle. There's no one before or after that's ever going to be like this one and we know that but he's trying to roll this out in in a very uh, miraculous way to say the least. All other kingdoms will come and go All other kingdoms will fail eventually, will be taken away by the end, but not Jesus' kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. But her response is slightly different from Zechariah, right? She says, well, how can I know this? It's it's not the, hey, prove it thing, but 
well, how can this be since I don't know a man? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you, will come over you, will overtake you, will envelop you, will descend upon you, operate as he operates. This is the bonding of mankind in God. And with permission, creating the Son of God. She says, be it done to me. This Son of Man, this Son of God, this one that is not about to become 50-50, that's how we think, somehow, he's 100% God, and he's 100% man. The one and the only. He's also the new Adam. He's also being the new humanity. He's also going to be the new messianic king, the messianic king. He's going to be the new king that brings a new kingdom all together, rolling forward. He is the God-man, Jesus. He is the first fruits of the family, and he is the only one that's going to perfectly fulfill all these incredible requirements of being holy, being blameless, being sinless, so that we can go back to the big context of the story of the Bible. He's redeeming us. God loves so much that he gave with this plan in place. Now, she didn't ask for a sign, but God graciously gives her one and says, well, you know, your relative Elizabeth, well, she's with child, and she's six months. Yes, that old barren one, she's with child. Oh, wow, okay, well, that, that's a really good signal for me, a really good sign that this could happen then to me. Well, with God, he says, nothing is impossible. Because she had to be thinking about that, too. Because she's already over here going, and I love. See, that, that's how we take a, uh, a difference but bring it together. An old woman, a young girl, it's impossible for you to get pregnant. It's impossible for you to get pregnant without having sex. So, and it's like, oh, there's a different way. Oh, there's a different way. God. And he's laying out this great story. So her response, I love this, and we're going to run out of time, aren't we? What time is it? Whew. I hate to hear the answer to this, but what time is it? 7.50. 7 Ten minutes. Ready, set. We're going to buckle up and roll. <clears throat> 39 through 45. Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. She made haste. She hears the word. She runs in haste. She enters the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And the reason I want to spend time here is it happened that when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb. How else could that possibly happen? Except that the spirit, Elizabeth, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. How did she know she was pregnant? Well, there was revelation. Oh, that's right. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. Got it. Okay. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, my master, my savior, my king would come to me? Remember, she's been hiding out for five months. Now it's the six months, so she's starting to get around town a little bit. For indeed, as soon as the sound of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Oh, blessed is she who believed. For there shall be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. My husband didn't really kind of believe this and kind of got in trouble. Blessed are you that you believe this, made this all come about and what's about to happen to you. A perplexing verse is verse 56. And Mary remained with her for about three months and returned to her house. I'm like, say what? She's basically... Like, six plus three is nine. Right around nine months, you are having this baby, and she's got to be the first woman that bailed on this whole situation. I don't get that. I don't know what happened. But usually they'd be like, hey, we're family. We're together. I, I don't understand that. It, it's there. It says it. it. says, Elizabeth's time in verse 57, full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And when her neighbors and the relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. And, of course, he's given the name of Jesus. I mean, sorry, given the name of John. Chapter 2, a couple verses. I'm going to jump. Oh, wow. 
Okay, I'm in so much trouble. All right, let's see. Um, everything you see up on the screen behind me, no baby could do. Couldn't control John that was going to be going before him and the announcement and the angels. Couldn't control that what we're about to read in chapter 2 and verse 1, 7, that a Roman emperor taking over that time was going to call for a census and was going to pull him out of Nazareth. But the reason he was from Nazareth is he was going to be said to be of Nazareth. And there's, man, I got like a gazillion notes on all that. But anyways, another day. So then he heads down to Bethlehem. Well, that's the city of David. This is, um, it's known as the house of bread. Well, how incredible is that? That here is the bread of life coming from the house of bread. He, baby isn't about to control what his name's going to be. I don't know if you picked this up, but what we just read about John and what's going to happen also with Jesus, they don't name him like out the gates. Hey, he's a boy. Great. This is John. They don't do that. Nope. They go and wait eight days. And then they go and name them. I don't know if they're trying to figure out good kid, bad kid, since their names meant stuff. I don't know. But in this case, they were given their name. So, oh my. Okay. Verse 7, chapter 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And there was no room for them in the inn. Well, we all know that part. That's all part of the song. That's, you know. Well, they said really probably what that manger really was is this is the idea of being the caves outside of town where the shepherds would keep and they would have the, the smoke and the fire and we can still go to these caves and they're stained up on the top. So it isn't like not here um, like in a wooden pasture. And he said, it's so interesting. He says, and there were in verse 8, in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were greatly afraid, which we all would be. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, great joy. It will be for all the people. There is born to you this day in the city of David. They're like, city of David. City of David. Bethlehem, city of David. I know that. City of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. Three things. You're going to go find a babe. You're going to find a babe that's wrapped in swaddling cloths, and you're going to find a babe that's lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with them this huge multitude, and they're praising God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it was when the angels had gone away from them, the shepherds said to one another, ooh, let's go now to Bethlehem. See, they knew. City of David, we know where we're going. Let's go look and find out about this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they made haste. They find Mary. They find Joseph. They find this babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, what they just heard. And all those who heard it, they marveled at the things that were told to them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things in her heart. And then the shepherds returned. They're glorifying, praising God for all the things that he had done. The cave holding area. The manger was probably, it's a feeding trough, but it's probably out of stone um, because of where it was, but perhaps not. Um, swaddling cloths. Some are saying that basically it was the torn strips that they would use, and so you would wrap this baby up, that it would be very different to hold this baby together. Um, the traditions of the shepherd, don't know if it's right or wrong, but they said a lot of times since they were only five to six miles outside of Jerusalem, a lot of times Passover time, that's where they held a lot of the Passover lambs. Don't know if it is or not, but that is a tradition that goes out there. Um, another um, thing that has been shared is shepherds were very lowly, and they were not allowed to give court testimony. Not so sure about that one. That one was about 300 years later that that kind of more came out in some teachings. may be true, but this I do know is true. Look at those shepherds, Abraham, Moses, David, the great shepherd Jesus about to come. And I'm going to go ahead and choose the same thing because you know Father's heart for everyone in this room is he shepherds your soul. He loves you. He wants you. Would you please receive that? Look what he's done. And I'll bring you peace. And he'll be the Prince of Peace. Great peace and goodwill to all mankind. All those scriptures. 
the goodwill, the delight, the pleasure, the peace, the shalom that comes. All of our burdens come and cast them on Jesus. And so the final thing, am I out of time? I am out of time. Ooh, five minutes. Yes. Okay. Here we go. This is going to get faster. So these parallels, um, I love, I love God. I just, I love the way he thinks and that he shares with us so that we can get little glimpses. And he probably shakes his head sometimes going, <laughs> you really still don't have a clue. But anyways, one day I'll tell you, right? All right, so the birth. He's born in a cave, most likely, from what we can see historically. He's wrapped in claws. Well, obviously, the death. He's buried in a cave, and he's wrapped in these linen claws. It's announced by angels. Here comes. Look what's just happened. When the, when the women get there, it's announced by angels. What are you doing here? Who are you looking for? Women, what are you doing? He's risen. The witnesses are lowly. That was the shepherd, common folk. The witnesses were women. They were lowly and common folk that they couldn't give testimony. If you were going to pick somebody, you probably wanted to pick Peter to be your main star witness, right? That would show up at the scene. Oh, yeah, I'll go tell everybody. His name at the birth, Jesus, Savior, the Messiah, the Emmanuel. The, the Jehovah is my salvation. Same thing, Jesus, Savior, the Messiah. He's known as the Son of Man. There's a huge study. You want to have some fun? Go dig into this one. I plan on doing this in 2024, a study just on the Son of Man. Witnesses. What was the witnesses' response at the birth, i.e. the shepherds? They ran out to go tell others. First, let's go look and see. We saw what it is. Once we saw that and we see them in the cave, we're going to go tell everybody. The witnesses' response, the women turn around and they make haste and they come running back and tell, i got to tell everybody, he is risen. The response of those that hear it, they're in awe. What? What are you saying? Like, this is the Messiah King that's finally shown up at this time in my lifetime? What? Like, the one we just said, crucify, crucify, crucify. He's not there. Pew, they take off running to go see. So what's the response? There's so many prophecies that are fulfilled that we cannot possibly get into tonight on both sides. And young baby human could not possibly make those things happen. And by the way, neither can a dead man. But God but God. Couldn't control the timing of his death, couldn't control the timing of his birth. Um, thank you for whew, running with me. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I hope we've done it justice as we've talked a little bit tonight to go back and maybe see the story afresh Think about it. Maybe you're going to take some of your family time and you're going to, hey, we're going to read this. Let's read some sections of this together and talk about it. Maybe we're going to try to reduce some of the stress. Maybe we're going to, let's put aside the secular and let's talk about this. Whew, boy, munch all the stress. I'd love to have some peace, right? The Prince of Peace came to give us peace. Would you embrace Jesus? Let's close out in prayer. Lord God, truly, glory to you in the highest. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your incredible timing. Thank you for the orchestration of John that would come before and would help to turn the hearts of the fathers to their kids. Thank you that you want to turn the disobedient back to you. Thank you that your heart is just that you just want us. You want us. That you're out for redemption. That's been your call. It is your plan A. There is only a plan A. And God, please forgive us if we ever start doing Jesus plus. It is all about what you're doing. And we're thankful. We're thankful that you say we should pray for one another, that we should be sharing the word.
that perhaps you would grant repentance. And we're thankful that that's your heart. We're thankful you're taking us home one day. We thank you that right now, here in less than seven days, we get to just think a little bit more about how Jesus came. Lowly, humble, vulnerable, in a very dirty cave. You laid the bread of life in a feeding trough for sheep. Your parallels are never a coincidence. We thank you for your miracles. Keep loving on us, Father. Keep forgiving us. Help us to walk with you. One day, we cannot wait to be face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.